Um, first of all, let me test this. This one only shows on that screen, and this one <laughs> shows on all of those. Good. OK. No, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in this area, because just next door is Birkbeck College, where I lectured for quite some years. And uh, we used to have Basil Hiley and David Bohm used to with me have, I think, weekly meetings. I can't quite remember how frequent they were. But we used to talk about quantum mechanics and other philosophical issues. And it was a very educational period for me. I was in the maths department. And so I think I tended to go over to the physics department, because there were more of them. And uh, these were valuable discussions. I remember Bohm particularly. He always struck me as a bit like a wave function. You'd, you'd ask a question, and he would zero right on that, give you a very profound, perceptive answer, and then it would start to spread out and go cover more and more of the universe. And then I'd lose track of where it was going. So no, no, and then I'd ask him another question, and whoop, it would collapse down to that point and start spreading out again. So I thought, gosh, that's, that's like a wave function, isn't it? Anyway, that illustrates one of the features which I've been worried about, about quantum mechanics for a long time. But I also, I should say that one of the things that influenced me very early was Bohm's version of the EPR. Um, some people call it a paradox, but the puzzle, if you like, the EPR puzzle. And the fact using spins and these things uh, struck me that you did need something non-local in order to describe how nature behaved. Uh, of course, John Bell later on made it much more precise that you needed exactly why you needed non-locality of some sort or other. Um, but this has a particular uh, role to play in my own understanding of this, because the issues, well, all these things have to do with the probabilities or the measurements. I mean, quantum mechanics always troubled me, because it's got these two bits to it, the unitary evolution on the one hand and the measurement process on the other hand. And OK, that's the way you use it, and that's the way you have to use it, apparently. And yet they are inconsistent with each other, because unitary evolution doesn't allow one result. In, the, in, in case your measurement, it happened to be in, in an eigenstate of that. If the state was in an eigenstate of what your measurement is, then it will stay there. But uh, otherwise, you have a problem of something which is non-unitary. And that worried me a lot. Uh, <clears throat> Now, I also had the belief, I'm not quite sure when I formulated this clearly to myself, that the measurement issue, OK, one can think about many worlds and all sorts of things like that, but that didn't appeal to me very much, at least initially. Perhaps it did, but then it didn't. Uh, it seemed to me you wanted some description of the world as we perceive it, and uh, that's what we want for, from a physical theory, not something which describes a suit, not just a lot of different worlds, but one huge, horrendous super, superposition of all these different worlds, which doesn't seem to be much like the universe we experience. Um, and the view that I certainly held for a long time is that this has to do with gravity. And it has to do with when you displace mass, if you have a superposition when there is a mass displacement of some significance between the two locations, and then your space-time somehow bifurcates or becomes a sort of blister and well, the view that I came around to eventually, of um, Lajos Diossi was had a view very much like this much before I did. But uh, also, uh, I think even John Bell was becoming to be interested in this just before he died, uh, as in the discussions I had with him at that time. But uh, the fact that it's gravity seems to me to be, at least if it's anything else, you're in more trouble. Because gravity, at least we know a lot about. Whereas if it's something else, that's, we don't know much about what something else might be. It could be almost anything. But if it's gravity, then the problem arises that, OK, something happens. You've got two separated things, and you, they, a measurement is performed of some sort. In other words, the state gets entangled with displacements of mass in some way, and that gets measured, and this gets measured. And so you have something in the space-time geometry which is non-local. 
And it did seem to me we really need a description of space-time geometry which is non-local. Now, people seem to think, and there'll be a lot of discussion here about space-time as being something sort of there, and uh, um, how do you have, a, have something non-local when it's got to have a space-time description? But it seems to me the space-time has to be, in some sense, a secondary notion. And the idea of twister theory, which is what this talk is about, is that you don't think of space-time points as being primary. You don't think of space-time as being primary. You think of space-time as being a secondary notion. And so let me give you... I have to say that I'm giving a very inappropriate talk. Not only am I using this outdated technology, but I'm also using slides which are not really designed for um, general audience. Never mind, I'll do my best. And I'll try to point out the features which I regard as key, and the formulae are really to either to frighten you or to say, well, look, there's something serious going on here. The mathematics is genuine. And so up right until the end where I have my own little qualms myself, I should say that the mathematics is, is completely genuine. And the fact that I've got formulae up here is just to show you, look, there are real honest formulae. Now, this picture here is a picture, a general picture showing you on the left-hand side, Minkowski space. And I should say that these ideas came up when I was with a group of people working on general relativity, and I couldn't get them to be interested at all, apart from one colleague who, who was very interested, but almost none of them were interested, because it all has to do with Minkowski space. Look, where's the curvature? Well, that's a key thing which I'll come to later. But first of all, we think about Minkowski space. And in Minkowski space, we have points, and there's one, and you have the light cone, and that's there. But I'm more interested in concentrating on light rays. So this is, see, I want a description which is fundamentally non-local. And the light ray is regarded as more basic than the point. So I make another space. And this space, the light ray is represented by a single point. So the color coding is meant to indicate that. And if you want a point, how do you describe that over here? Well, it's the sphere of all the light rays which go through it. And the thing that struck me about this quite early on is that sphere, well, that's the sphere, the celestial sphere. Sphere. You look out at the sky, imagine somebody in space looking out at the sky, and, and that person sees stars all over the place. And then a colleague of this person comes whizzing by at a good fraction of the speed of light, takes a snapshot of the same sky going by you, and what is the transformation between one sky and the other? Well, what struck me about this is the transformation is a transformation which is conformal. In other words, if you think of this sphere as being a Riemann sphere, in other words, the complex numbers together with a point of infinity, then the transformations of that sphere to itself, which preserve that complex structure, are exactly those of the Lorentz group. And so thinking of it as a complex sphere, in other words, a complex line, it's a, it's a complex one-dimensional space, seemed to me is a fundamental way of thinking. There's another input into this, which was when I was an undergraduate studying mathematics, I became absolutely um, stunned and, and uh, overwhelmed by the beauty and power of complex analysis. And this is something that seemed to me, wouldn't it be wonderful if somehow nature was based on this? And then I learned about quantum mechanics, and I said, my God, it is based on it. Quantum mechanics uses the complex numbers in a fundamental way, and this to me was a great attraction to the formalism of quantum mechanics. And then when we consider the ratios of two complex amplitudes, you get this sphere. Well, it could be the Bloch sphere, if you like, then, but it's one instance of the Riemann sphere. But the thing is, the idea is that somehow it would be lovely if this space was, in some sense, a complex space. Well, let me be a little more technical, so I do, just to show you there are equations. These are the equations you use to give this description. And here we have the, uh, these coordinates of the space-time coordinates, x, y, z, and t, speed of light is pretty equal to 1. And these, the z's, are the twister coordinates, the ratios of which give you the points of this space. However, the light, light ray space is five-dimensional. Five is an odd number. And if this were to be a complex space, in real terms, it would have been an even number. So this is a little bit of a problem. But you explain that by saying, well, there is this relationship which has to hold. It's this uh, emission form of split signature, plus, plus, minus, minus. 
which um, if that's 0, then you're on this space. Well, you can do better than that. Let me do better than that uh, by saying, well, actually, it's better if we think of this space, this five-dimensional space, as a subspace, a hypersurface of a six-dimensional space, where that six-dimensional space still has a nice, this is rather a miracle I found when, when realizing what was going here, on here, that this bigger space, I'm going to call that PT, P stands for projective, T stands for twister space, PN, the, these are the null twisters, the one for which that quadratic form vanishes. And so this space represents the light rays, but what do those things represent? Well, I'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, there's probably something I should read at the bottom of this thing here, but let me not read too much of it or I'll just waste time. Um, I'll just leave that for the moment. What, how do we interpret that other register space? Well, for that, I really need not to think about the projective space, but I need to think about the vector space, which that projective space comes from. So this is twister space. So I imagine that there's a zero of the twisters, and these one-dimensional subspaces represent the points of the space here. And I really need that for the full description. But what you find is that not only is this an inside space described, but the whole space is described. And that not only do you get light rays, but you get zero mass particles which have a helicity. So the angular momentum is also incorporated. And magically, that gives you this whole projective space, which is the complex manifold here. And this is indeed a one-dimensional complex manifold. So it all fits together. You get a complex manifold. And the beauty of this complex analysis, which I'd become very attracted to, um, was something that I was very pleased to see coming out of this. This is the slide I use for all the complicated formulae, so you don't have to read them all. Um, I'm just showing the notation. So forget it if you don't want to follow anything in the details. But the notation does involve two component spinners. And I was very attract attracted to two component spinners. I'm going to put this one on that slide, too, in a minute. But I, just to show you there are nice formulae, that's what they are. The four variables, the z's, uh, four complex numbers, the ratios of them give you the projective twister space. And these things really co correspond to two spinners. And the relationship between the space-time point that's in here and the two spinners is that. The z is the pair of spinners. The incidence between the, that's the incidence relation, which is to say when the point lies on a line or a line. Let, let me not go into the details. But the point I really want to say is, that these things do correspond by a formula to the momentum and angular momentum of a massless particle. Here's another little bit of a miracle, that in ordinary formalism, you find that if you want to describe a massless particle uh, in ordinary formalism, you find it's quite complicated. And you have a relationship, which is the pali lubensky spin vector is proportional to the momentum. And this all comes out very automatically when you have this formula. I'm going to put this over here. This is just for the notation. So if you've memorized all that already, you can understand what the next slide is. But uh, I'm, as I say, I'm just putting this up to scare you mainly. Uh, but uh, if you, it's also to say, yes, there's good solid mathematics behind all this. And uh, this will become more important in a minute. OK, now, suppose I want to describe a wave function using twister variable. I did have in this other slide, just for a moment, I have a twister, and I have the complex conjugate. Its two spinner parts get reversed when you take the complex conjugate. Uh, but if there is a complex conjugate if you're a twister. And the complex conjugate has index on the other, other way around. In other words, it's a member of the dual space. So the complex conjugate space is also a dual, and it's also a canonical conjugate. So in quantum mechanics, you have these canonical variables, the twister and its complex conjugate. And then if you want to make a wave function, the rule is, well, with space, momentum, and position, you say, well, you, have, you either have a position representation or a momentum representation. And if you have a position one, then d by d position is the momentum. And if you have the momentum one, then d by d momentum is the position. It's just the same here. So that you have the complex conjugate variable is now the canonical conjugate. 
And so if I want to say a wave function, I have a function of z which is independent of z bar. What does that mean? What does it mean independent of z bar? It means partial derivative with respect to z bar is zero. In other words, that's the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So what it means if you've got holomorphic. I thought, thought this was a miracle when I got this because it seemed to me I love these complex analytic things. Holomorphic, that means complex analytic. It means you can write in a power series as differentiable as you like. Beautiful things. And these holomorphic functions are what you get automatically for your wave function. And these wave functions, you say, what's the helicity? Well, I've got it here. Little s is the helicity. And for the different values of the helicity, you get different homogeneities of your holomorphic function. So my twister wave function is a function of z which is holomorphic, complex analytic. Or I could use the conjugate variables. It's like going from position to momentum, but now it's the complex conjugate variable. And instead of using z bar, I'll relabel it w. And if it's holomorphic in w, that's a lower index object, a dual twister, then that will be um, the, the conjugate representation. But it's got to be one or the other. And the helicity, so I'll put this one up here, so if you want the details, you can see that too over here. The, uh, the helicity gives you homogeneities. The, the Euler operator, uh, which is written down there somewhere, if you can see it. I guess it's that S thing in the middle here, um, wherever it is. The, the, it's, it's the Euler homogeneity operator shifted a little bit. Don't worry about the details. Now you say, how do the, this holomorphic twister function correspond to a wave function in the ordinary sense. Well, here we have, again, this is using all this notation, which I don't worry about the details, but if you want to write down the wave functions for a massless particle of arbitrary helicity, arbitrary spin, it could be a, photo, it could be a scalar field, it could be a, a massless neutrino, or it could be a Maxwell field, or it could be a linearized gravitation, so spin one or spin two, and then there's a relationship between these helicities Helicity 1 or minus 1, helicity 2 or minus 2 for gravity. And those things correspond to homogeneity degrees. And you see it's very curious, the asymmetry between... Uh, you see, if you're looking at Maxwell case here, where is Maxwell? This is one here. The homogeneity degrees in the Maxwell case are minus 4. I think I've got some... Oh, no, this, is, this here is, is S. That's right. So if the, if the helicity... I think this should be, that's right. If the helicity is 1 or minus 1, you, in the z's, I've got mi minus 4 degree homogeneity or 0. So the left-handed ones are minus 4 and the right-handed ones, never mind, I think I've made it the wrong way. It doesn't matter. But the point is that if I stick to my z description, you see the homogeneities are completely lopsided. If I use the w's, it's the other way around, but completely lopsided. And you see it's particularly so in the case of gravity, where you've got plus 2 to minus 6. So you say, well, they're just reflecting. Well, you see, twister theory is a very chiral theory. It, it says one helicity is very different from the other, which is both nice in a way and a great nuisance in a way, too. And then you'll see why it's a great nuisance that will come. OK, don't, again, worry too much about the details, because that's not what I'm trying to express here. I'm trying to express certain key issues, which I'll come to very shortly. Now, what is the relation between the ordinary idea of a wave function, which is what I'm saying, these things with all the indices, uh, that describe, depending on how many indices are, you get the different, different spins. How do you relate that to a twister function? Well, there's a rather remarkable formula, which says it's a contour integral. You just take your twister function, you do a contour integral, and that pops the field. And the field equation is automatically satisfied by the expression. I always thought this was a bit of a miracle, too. And you can get both helicities here, depending on which formula you take. Again, I'm not going to talk about details, but you can do this contour integral either with this expression if it's left-handed and this expression if it's right-handed. If it's with w's rather than z, it would be the other way around, but let's stick to one. Now, if you're going to do a contour integral, you see an ordinary complex analysis, if you want to get an answer, you integrate round singularities. So that means you've got to have some singularities somewhere to give you an answer. How does this work? Well, I've done it for the case of a, a spin zero, and you see homogeneity minus two. That's about a simple expression. You can have one over product of two things. Homo homogeneity one over it, so it's one minus one 
for each of these, minus two altogether. And these singularities are two planes in this picture. And here this line represents the point. Remember that a point in space-time corresponds to one of these Riemann spheres. You can think of that as a line. But I can't draw both pictures at once. It's a little confusing. So it's a projective line, but it's really a sphere. And then the singularities are these orange thing and the green thing. And then your contour goes around them. And that gives you an answer. And lo and behold, this gives you all these fields with different spins using that. Very beautiful. Uh, I found this formula, and without knowing that people, I think it was, um, well, Bateman was the main one who'd, who'd already done these things in a different notation for the Maxwell field and so on. So it wasn't altogether original, but nevertheless, it was a, in Twister theory, it was the right way to do things. But I got worried by all this. I should say also that the, another feature of wave functions is automatically incorporated here, namely that you have positive frequency. So this was a, a feature. Uh, not sure I've got the right picture here. Yeah, this one will do. See, if I'm going into the top half of twister space, if the line creeps up at the top half and it still works, that means I have a field which is positive frequency and represents a, a wave function in the ordinary sense. So it, gets you all the features you want of a wave function automatically by just doing this contour integral. But I worried about this because it's, it's a mess in a certain way because you've got these two camel humps here of singularities. OK, I've got them as regions here. They could be great messes of things. And your contour separates the two. Then it works, and you get solutions. But suppose you say, I want to add two fields together, and they're pointing in different directions. Then these camel humps will be different places. And how do you make sense of that? And for a while, I couldn't understand what was going on until, well, mainly it was Michael Atia who uh, reminded me of something which I should have been learning when I was a graduate student. It was going on at the time, and I hadn't picked up on it. This notion of sheaf cohomology. Now, this is a key thing I want to try and explain. So bear with me. I'll put this on the other side. So if you want to remind yourself of the details here, let me put that down. The key thing is, how do you make sense if this curiously lopsided pair of camel humps, camel humps, that doesn't make sense? What's nice and smooth and makes sense? Well, I'm looking at the same thing. Here is the top half of twisted space again. That's what corresponds to positive frequency in this picture. And how do I think of it? I don't think of it as a space with two great holes in it. I think it is the following way. This space, the whole space, is the union of two open sets, where one where I leave out one camel hump and the other where I leave out the other cam camel hump. The function itself is defined on the intersection of the two sets. That's this space with both camel humps taken out. So that's where it's holomorphic. This is the thing I'm talking about. Now, this is an example of sheaf cohomology. I could have a much more complicated thing where I have loads and loads of these patches. And let me not explain all this. This is more or less what you do if you have a covering and you say, what do you mean by the first cohomology element? Well, if you know about these things already, that's fine. But if you don't know about these things already, let me give you a picture which explains what's going on. It was nice. Tim Palmer had the same picture for a completely different reason. Or I wonder, maybe it was a similar reason. That would be a nice thing to think about. Let me just leave that there, over here. But what is the picture? Well, the picture is this one. This is an impossible picture. It's a, what people call a tri-bar. But it represents this very notion of cohomology. Why does it? Well, you see, right here I'm splitting your thing up into pieces. How do you interpret this picture? Well, let me break the picture up into pieces first. So I'll break it up into pieces. There we are. And now I'll separate the pieces. So I have now three pictures, each of which has a pretty unambiguous interpretation. It's a joint. Two pieces of wood jointed up through, say, a right angle. There is an ambiguity, because you don't know how far away that thing is. And that's the ambiguity which you're depending on here. Now, I want to assemble the whole thing. And to assemble it, I say, I want to patch that with that. 
So I have some instruction which tells me how close, how do I match them together. And then I have an instruction which tells me how I match those together and how I match those together. And then I work out something, which is the cohomology element, which I've done here, all I said. What you do is you work out these differences and you do all that modulo something or other. Let me not go into the details there. But the same point is what's going on here. It's exactly the same thing. I say, I've got these instructions for how to match each of these things. Those are like the twister function where the holomorphic function is defined. And then does it fit? Well, you work out this thing, which is the cohomology element. If that's zero, then it fits. In the case of this triangle, you don't get zero. And this gives you a measure of the degree of impossibility. Well, that is really the same idea. This is the first cohomology element. Uh, it's a first cohomology element. I'll say what a second one might be later on. I should say that this, I set this as a, student, a problem for students. And occasionally, a student would come to me with what they thought was a solution. And I never, never thought they'd like I've never solved it either. That is to find an analog of that triangle which represents second cohomology. I'll come to that in a minute, just why you want that. But you see, it's, it's the same thing here. You've got the essence of what this function represents. Sorry, I, let me bring this picture back, because I think this is really what to think about. You see, here I have pictures of rigid objects, which I'm trying to glue. And because of the ambiguity in the picture of how far away it is, I, I need to work out this cohomology element to see if it fits. But the cohomology represents, represents a tension in this picture as a whole. Now, in the complex analytic things I'm doing, it's not the rigidity of a piece of wood I'm talking about. It's the rigidity of holomorphic functions. You see, holomorphic functions have this property. You've got a power series expansion, beautiful thing, but very puzzling. You power series expansion, once you've fixed it here, it tells you what's going on over there. You take a big root, though, and come back, and it may not fit. So there is a cohomology element which tells you, does that thing fit as you go all the way around? And that's exactly what's going on in those quantum integrals. And it's the same thing here. But here, it's the rigidity of a rigid body that you're talking about. And there, it's the rigidity of holomorphic functions. And it's exactly that which is representing the, uh, the wave function. Now, this is the point I'm trying to make here. And here is a kind of non-locality, which was much more subtle than the, non the rather trivial non-locality that a light ray is non-local. It's not at a point. But here you have a non-locality, which is much deeper. And it's something you can't say where it is. You say, what's wrong with that picture? Well, you must say, oh, that corner's wrong. Yes, OK, that's fine. It works now. No, no, but suppose I took that corner out. Oh, sorry. Yes, no, it could be here, that's wrong. Or that one. Or it could even be that edge, perhaps that's where. The, the, what's wrong is not a local feature. What's wrong is what the wave function is saying in the twister theory. The what's wrong is the wave function, is the, is the particle, if you like. I and mean, I like to think of it like this. Maybe there is a, a photon coming at us from a very distant galaxy. And that photon's wave function is spread out over millions and millions and millions of light years. And then an astronomer, whoops, that sees that photon. Suddenly, that thing was spread out over there and becomes visible to that observer. Well, it's as though it's this impossible triangle was spread out over, over the whole sky. And perceiving it at one point, or measuring it, having a photographic plate or something which couples it to something else, which constitutes the measurement. And that removes this particular impossibility. But it's not localized anywhere. So that's the picture that I like to have about the kind of non-locality which is involved here. I did so briefly mention about second cohomology. This is first cohomology. First cohomology has to do with single particles. So if you're talking about the wave function of a single particle, it's just this kind with the impossible triangle. But if it was two particles, and that's where you get Bell inequalities and things like that, then it's second cohomology. So it's a little bit more subtle. But nevertheless, this aspect of cohomology representing the puzzles that we have about how things can't be seemingly represented in space-time. But yet, it's coupled to the space-time. OK, well, let's say a bit more about that, because I've just been talking about wave functions painted on space-time. 
What about the space-time itself? Well, painted on twisted space, I suppose I was saying. Well, you see, this construction generalizes in two ways. There's another way you can think of first cohomology. One of them is, is if you want, here's your space at the bottom with its cohomology, and then you try to build a bundle over it. So this is a fiber bundle, if you know what those things are. And fiber bundles are also represented, they're represented by first cohomology elements. What about space times? Well, I'm talking now about twister spaces, which I'm trying to curve now. So, so, let's, so this is a piece of a Minkowski version, twister space. That's another one, that's another one, that's another one. And I can imagine piecing it together. I can, just as what I was doing, I can talk a wave function, and that wave function could be of a graviton, if you like. But suppose it's, it, it's not just a passive thing, which is a linear graviton, but something which is actually doing something non-linear and therefore affecting the space itself. So it's, it's not just painted on, it represents a displacement. So you could say, it says, shove this patch relative to this one, shove that one relative to that, and so on, and now you get a curved space. So you can produce a curved twister space out of a cohomology element. And if this is of the homogeneity degree plus two, thank you. If it's homogeneity degree plus two, then that course, you can write down an expression and that corresponds to deforming the space. Okay, so this is what we call the nonlinear graviton. And it's rather remarkable, remarkable. Well, let me say something else before saying what's rather remarkable. Something else I want to say is in twister theory, it's all conformally invariant. So there's nothing which tells you a distance anywhere. Um, the whole theory is right from the start is invariant under, under local changes of scale. Leave the light cone alone, but change the scale. Now, if you want the scale, you introduce a thing called the infinity twister. And this infinity twister, I've represented it here, that's what it looks like in the notation. If there's a cosmological constant, it's quite interesting. If you put a cosmological constant in, which is what I've done here, that's the lambda, then it's a more interesting structure than in the Minkowski case. And you have, let me, I'll just put that on the other side. I don't want to talk about that particularly. It's just to tell you there is this thing, the I alpha beta, called the infinity twister, which gives you, breaks the conformal invariance and gives you a notion of distance. And the remarkable thing is that if you patch these things together, now with finite displacements, and you preserve that infinity twister, then the curved twister space you get automatically gives you a space-time which satisfies the Einstein vacuum equations with cosmological constant lambda. Now, what's, what do I mean by that? See, there's no, there's no lines in this picture. There's no points, space-time points in this picture. But there are, because you say, okay, find a Riemann sphere which closes up, and there's a theorem which tells you how many of these there are, belong to the right topological family, and you find the freedom is four-dimensional, and so therefore the space of these things is a four-dimensional space, and that four-dimensional space has a metric, because of the infinity twister, which automatically satisfies the Einstein vacuum equations. Rather remarkable, the Einstein vacuum equations come flopping out automatically. With cosmological, con I did it first without the cosmological constant, my student Richard Ward did it with the cosmological constant. He also did this construction with Yang Mills theory where you can make this nonlinear too. Let's not go into that at the moment. So that's very beautiful. You've got Einstein's equations automatically. However, there is a huge catch. The huge catch is, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the theory is chiral. And this is for the homogeneity degree plus two, which is for the left-handed graviton you get complex spaces. It's like a wave function. It's not like a classical space-time. It's like a wave function, and that wave function is automatically left-handed. Now, I've been struggling over this for about 40 years. It's what I call the googly problem. Those of you who belong to the former British, British Empire will perhaps know what a googly is. A googly is a cricket ball which is bowled with an action which makes it look as though it spins left-handed when it actually spins right-handed. 
So the googly problem was how do you take that framework of twister theory, which naturally gives you the left-handed ones, and make it do the right-handed ones? So this is this problem which I've been stuck with for ages. Very irritating problem, the googly problem. And what's the answer? Well, I think I know what the answer ought to be. And let me tell you what it is. This is this thing we call palatial twister theory. Maybe I'll even put this on the other side. You probably don't need to see the other picture anymore. It's, uh, this is just saying we want to do the right-handed version in the same framework as the left-handed. OK, you can do it all the other way around and use the Ws and not the Zs, but then you're stuck the other way. So you want to do them both at once so you could form a notion of, say, a plane polarized gravitational wave or something like that. You need both left-handed and right-handed in superposition, so your framework has to be large enough to incorporate both at the same time. Well, the, uh, let me tell you what I think the answer is. Yeah, let me tell you about the, uh, by showing you a, a horrible picture first. What you do, this is a, a conversation I had with Michael Atiyah, a very brief one. And I was playing this problem. I've been stuck with this googly problem for all this time. And you can see once you patch these spaces together, you automatically give that these structures which, which give you left-handed. And you can't get the right-handed. I tried this and I tried it the other, usually going out to infinity and maybe structure a simpler out infinity and then trying to bring it back again. But should you be going out to infinity to do something local? Didn't seem right. Anyway, so I started thinking about, well, OK, when you patch these things, maybe in some sense you patch the algebras without knowing what the points are. And Michael said to me when I mentioned this, he says, no, no, that won't work. If you know the algebras, you automatically know the points. Well, so I sort of knew that already. Then there was a pause. And he said, but that's not true if it's a non-commutative algebra. And I thought, wow. Why did I think wow? Well, because this commutation rule between the twisters and their complex conjugates is already implicit in the things I've been telling you before. You see, when you talk about the complex conjugates, it's really the differential op. See, when I said Z and Z bar are canonical conjugates as well as, as well as complex conjugates, that means when you look at the barred version, that's really differentiation with respect to this version. And so if that's a differential operator, these are non-commuting operators. Z bar is d by dz, if you like. And you have these commutation rules. And this commutation rules, see, I, this is one of the striking things about twisted theory. You keep borrowing things from quantum mechanics, even though you're still doing classical theory. I'm trying to produce a classical space-time, and I find I'm borrowing notions from quantum mechanics. And I find that very striking. It was right there at the beginning, because one is borrowing the notions of um, how much? OK, thank you. Borrowing the notions, um, uh, well, whatever it was. But now I'm borrowing the notions of the non-commuting algebras and so on. So the idea is now I try to pick, piece things together in the same sort of way. But where I don't have points here and points here, I simply have these algebras. So I have the quantum algebras of the Zs. Now the thing is that if you had, I like to use a quantum language here. If you had a, a ket space, think of Dirac operators acting over way over on the, the right-hand side, there's a cat sitting over there, and they're all acting on that. But you get used to the algebra, and you're not so interested in what the cat is. And you could think of another cat over there, or cat space, and the same algebra. But here you have something where the cat space can't be consistent over the whole space. And that's where you get something new. You have something which is, cons the algebra makes sense over the whole space, but the cat space cannot be kept consistent over the whole space. And I think that's the right idea. But to make it work has been a great nuisance. And uh, I think I'm just going to shove up a couple of slides saying what sort of thing you do. One of the things you have to do is a thing called local twister theory. You, can, you don't have twisters generally for the whole space, but you can have them at a, at a point, and then you can carry them along a light ray. So given any light ray, you have a flat twister space associated with it. It's a sort of tangent space in a way. And uh, a remarkable thing about this is that if you have this infinity twister, something which is preserved by all this, then you automatically have the Einstein equations. So the Einstein equations are built into keeping the infinity twister, which is a quite striking thing. So what do I say you do? 
The answer is I don't quite know. But the sort of thing you do is this. Something like you've got your light rays, and the light ray space is well defined, and you can form a, this kind of pseudo twister, pseudo tangent space from the uh, local twister idea, and then you can, in the light ray space, you can form patches and so on, and then you can try and do, make this global. I won't go into this largely because I'm not sure I've got it right, but it's something like that. Okay, as a final comment, I, I, perhaps I'll put that on the other side so you can stare at it if you want to. But don't stare at it too carefully because I don't think I've got it quite right yet. But there is a procedure which I think is close to being what you need to do. I only want to end on one point here, which is on a transparency which has disappeared on me. Here it is. Okay, this is not quantum gravity. I'm trying to do classical gravity theory, but there are some non-local ideas, and you can think of it as a background for quantum things. And why is it not quantum gravity? Well, there's one very important reason. It can't possibly be quantum gravity, because there is no role for the Planck length. OK, I have Planck's constant here, h, but then you put that equal to 1, and then it's gone. You don't have a role for the Planck length. However, and this was the thing which where, when I thought about this commutator, the idea occurred to me, why not a commutator between the Zs with the infinity twister on this side? And in those days, there wasn't a cosmological constant. At least people didn't know there was. And in those days, since I thought there wasn't a cosmological constant, this I thing is a degenerate thing, and I realized that these commutators between Zs and Zs and between Zs and Z bars can be el eliminated. Not, they don't do anything. You just redefine your z's and you're back where you started. But when this has a cosmological constant term in it, this thing is non-degenerate and you get something new. So here is a conjecture. I don't quite know what the nature of this conjecture is, but that somehow there is a number here which I call epsilon. The i has the cosmological constant in it. You have two numbers. They give you two different lengths together. One the Planck length and the other is, comes from the cosmological constant. There's an absolutely vast difference, something of, uh, I don't know, 10 to the 120 or whatever it is, between these two things. But you have big numbers in physics, and maybe that's OK. I don't know how to make this work. I haven't even thought seriously about it. But you'd have to use this kind of comet to carry this idea to do anything which is quantum gravity, where the state reduction, the whole problem I mentioned at the beginning, how do you have a theory in which Somehow, quantum state reduction corresponds to uh, gravity coming in and saying this or this happens with a certain probability. Where does that come from? Well, it has to come from something else other than these commutators because there is no role for the Planck length. It is very much the Planck length which is involved when you want to measure how, see, you form this blister between space times, if you like, and when does that blister say you've got to make a choice? Only when that size of that blister is roughly speak, speaking of the order one Planck units. So it's the Planck thing has got to come in. Maybe in the future there will be some way of understanding these commutators, and that's the hope I'm trying to express here. Well, thank you very much.